share with people. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction and then uh, the floor is totally yours for talking about your topic today. So you're a USATF level three endurance and IAAF now known as World Athletics level five elite endurance running coach. You have over 30 years of experience. You have a master's degree in exercise science and business administration and soon you'll complete your PhD in health and human performance, which is also known as exercise science from Concordia University, Chicago. You coach dozens of NCAA D1 runners, high schoolers, national champions, and national record holders. National record holders. On top of that, you're the coach of the upcoming elite running team, 10 Man Elite, that's based here in Boulder, Colorado. You're also coach of the newly formed 10 Man Track Club. So um, today we're really excited to talk uh, about uh, <clears throat> maintaining elite performance and how the running world will change. Uh, for now, the floor is totally yours. We'll do a question and answer bit at the end with some of the questions that we have. And then if anybody watching live has questions, please feel free to uh, drop them in the uh, question box and we'll be able to push them along at the end of Tom's presentation. But uh, without further ado, Tom, the floor is totally yours. Oh, I thought you were going to ask me questions. Okay. Um, you did send me some questions ahead of sure. time for my yep. request, and I really appreciate that. Mostly just like topic areas, and and first topic was adjusting the current pan, uh, adjusting to the current pandemic situation. Yes. And the question you ask is how are you managing client and elite team needs in the trying current situation? Um, first, I encourage making lemonade out of lemons. In other words, your attitude. Uh, you could you could just you know cave into this situation or you can look for opportunity. And pretty much all of life, if you're looking for opportunity, you're gonna find, uh, you, you'll find solutions, uh, you'll find that your attitude elevates and you're ready to tackle life. So that's the first one, um, attitude, make lemonade out of lemon. Second, uh, I said, uh, I'm revising uh, training schedules to focus on developing a stronger foundation and a more gradual buildup. Um, I think it's a big deal. If if you're in this situation, you might as well just continue to build whatever foundational components that you normally do in the off season, just for a longer period of time. Um, third, I encourage runners to establish long term goals. I the one thing about runners is, like all athletes, is they thrive when they have goals in, in mind. Um, they get more lazy, they get uh, apathetic when they don't have goals. They're not like normal people. They're not, right? They rise to the occasion. They like the challenge. And so it's important to have long-term goals. So when, as an example, you might say, hey, I'm a track guy. Um, let's say I'm a lead track guy. Well, the problem won't be any races in April or May maybe not even June, but we'll probably get going either July or maybe early August, something like that. And I guarantee you meet directors out there are going to find, uh, find ways of making it possible for athletes to compete later in the summer. So in your mind, maybe set up, hey, I'm going to be competing on August 10th. I better be ready to roll. So Somewhere maybe about a month before that, I'm starting to do some time trials, that sort of thing, kind of get myself ready because I haven't been racing for a long time. Or maybe certain key workouts that you like to use, they kind of get you into the racing mode, so to speak. If you're a road racer, you're thinking, hey, I'm going to probably run uh, a 10K, like the Beach to Beacon or something like that in August. Um, maybe I'll run a half marathon in september and maybe i'll shoot maybe i'll anticipate the chicago marathon is going to be held um or maybe i'm going to shoot for a cim or something like that or berlin is berlin in the fall it seems like it is yeah it's a september race yeah yeah maybe yeah. something like that if you're a european uh and you're and you're shooting for something like berlin and expect it'll probably be on mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I have one kind of follow up on this for a lot of people listening that maybe aren't on the elite side. You mentioned 
um, you know, races having prize money and, you know, races getting canceled now impacts athletes. How do athletes kind of uh, adjust? And maybe you can peel back the layers of how does an athlete normally decide, uh, you know, working with your athletes? How do you decide, say, hey, you should go do, you know, this track race, uh, you know, in a normal scenario, and then maybe how it kind of switches now or what races you look for as a coach for the elite athletes? So in a normal situation, normal context, where we're looking at development as the primary focus. What do I need to get me to the level I um, want to be at when I'm at the championships? So for example, in the United States, we had the U.S. Olympic trials, okay, or the national championships in uh, uh, other years. Like, for example, last summer in July, we had the national championships in Des Moines at Drake University. Well, you're setting up in your mind the kinds of preparatory races that will get you to the point where a you've qual got to qual a you qualify if you haven't already, and b if you've already qualified, um, you may be taking a slightly different approach. But any of the the spring races and early summer races have to get you to the point where you're feeling great and on top of your game when you get to uh, when you get to the nationals. It would be the same if you were a high school runner or you know trying to shoot for may or june state championships in a normal year it does you no good to race 25 times before going to the state mean and then you got nothing left in the tank and unfortunately too many high school coaches feel compelled to race their athletes often to score points and uh, but I will tell you, the very successful high school coaches have a different viewpoint. They're like, OK, look, I could take glory and we could we could kick everybody's buttons and have every, have my top athletes race in three races at every track meet. Or we can take a long term view and say nothing really matters until the last three or four weeks of the season. Um, so everything's about thinking long term in a normal context. Well, uh, I would suggest that the same kind of view needs to be taken with a slight modification in the current situation. Um, we don't know if we're going to have a national championship, but I'm guessing we will. Um, I'm guessing the Olympic trials will be postponed for track and field until um, next year. But my guess is USA Track and Field is going to say we need to have a national championship. So they might put, make it uh, September. Who knows? Okay, something like that, or August. Um, I would rather they actually delay it. I, I've always thought that it's kind of foolishness uh, in track and field to have all these championships when it's hotter and blazes outside. It's fine if you're a 100, 200 meter sprinter, maybe a 400 meter, but it already starts getting deleterious at 800 meters. And it certainly crushes, crushes the performance of anybody 1,500 meters and up. You simply can't run very well. And I would suggest that it favors the athletes who have some particular ability to run well in hot weather. Mm -hmm. And the guys that are uh, or gals that are not as good at hot weather have a severe disadvantage. Mm -hmm. I've seen this over and over where in the spring or, say, September, an athlete might run really well let's let's pick somebody out of the blue that's not on my team let's say johnny gregoric sure good, good guy really respect him a lot i like this like his dad mm -hmm. like his coach anyway maybe johnny's the type of guy that uh, races well when it's 70 degrees out in the 1500 mm -hmm. but he runs three seconds four seconds slower you know in 90 degrees in des moines iowa in the middle of the summer mm -hmm. He might have been first, second, or third, and he ends up becoming fifth, sixth, or seventh in the hot weather. Right. But if you raced six different times against the same field, Johnny being the top three, four or five out of those six. Right. When the weather is decent. Right. But when it's hot, four or five times out of six, he's way back. Mm -hmm. That's I'm just kind of making it up, and I don't right. – 100% know about Johnny's profile. I just kind of use that as an example. <laughs> but yeah, these are um, these are things for like the Boston Marathon being postponed until September. These are going to be things for, you know, elites and non-elites as well that have to transition if they have a goal race that was normally going to be, you know, 
March or April or May, and then it all of a sudden gets postponed to when it can still be hot and humid. So even a mm -hmm. um, regular runner has to take these sort of things into kind of consideration, which segues into the um, you know the the second sort of topic of how can uh, you know the strategies that you have for the elites be kind of transitioned to somebody that might be listening to this or watching this um, that might not be an elite runner, but they still want to. Uh, take some of these strategies and adjust them for their situation? Well, I would suggest the major uh, mistake made by the average runner, the non-elite, the recreational runner, whatever you want to call them, is that they don't target specific big goals. What they do is they just want to race all the time. And you're never, ever going to reach your top potential doing that. Elite athletes know that you just – you can only target maybe a couple of maximum three really good races at the end of the season. So you use any other race leading up to that as preparation, whether it's to refine your pacing strategies, your fueling and hydration strategies, your warm up routines, fine tuning your body, um, learning from the situation you run. If you're a, say a 5,000 meter runner and you're elite 5,000 meter runner and you go and run a 1500 meter, say at Occidental, well, are you doing it because you're trying to prove anything in the 1500? No, not really. You're doing it as A, you like to get out there and race occasionally, but B, you're using it as information. Okay, is my speed, even though I've been really focusing on aerobic development and strength, and I jump into 1500 and I run a 337, and I haven't really been doing a lot of race pace or fast and race pace work. What does it show me? It probably shows me that I don't need to be in a panic. I don't need to start doing a bunch of int intense quality training anytime soon because the championships is, are two months away, right? And I'm already at 337 and I'm a 5,000 meter guy, right? So at that point, you just keep doing what you're doing. You keep doing a lot of longer intervals, longer tempo runs, keep your volume up, do your hills, all those sorts of things. But if you go in there and you run 342 and you're a guy that wants to run 1315 and you know that at 1315 you probably need at least a 337 ability as your basic speed indicator. So if you're at 342 and you're two months away, you probably need to start doing some quality training that are shorter, like repeat 400s or whatever, right? All the great coaches use benchmarks. Well, as a, as a recreational runner, you should do the same thing. If you're always running the 5K every single weekend, how are you going to be able to tell whether you need to alter your training or not? Maybe you need to do a, a, a one-mile road race, or maybe you get on the track and do a 1,600-meter time trial, four laps, okay, to test yourself, right? Maybe you need to jump in a 10K or a 15K or a 10 mile race to see how your endurance is, is doing. And if your 10K or especially your 10, 15K, 10 mile or half marathon times don't match up to your 5K, meaning they're significantly slower on the predicted charts, right? The equivalency charts. That means your real need is endurance. You need to get out there and get more distance work in, longer intervals, tempos, that sort of, you don't need to be doing VO2 max training if your mar half marathon time is significantly worse on the equivalency table than your 5K time. And I guarantee if your five or if your half marathon um, performance is subpar compared to your 5K time, that means your, your mile time is really great if you were to jump into it, right? You have to profile yourself. Average everyday runners never think of that. First of all, most of them don't have coaches, and they should. And just showing up at some running club with the, a novice coach, you know, doesn't doesn't do you anything because all they do is re prescribe repeat 400s, 800s as fast as anybody can go, and you just try to keep up with the leaders. There's no individual prescription there. So let's say somebody um, listened to this and they say, hey, you know, maybe – now is a great time because my races in the next, you know, eight to 12 weeks uh, look like they're not going to happen. 
what would you uh, encourage maybe like, um, you know, a couple steps for somebody to figure out whether they are, you know, maybe predisposed more, their, their training right now is better for the 5K, how would they figure out um, by maybe doing a set of time trials, whether they need to add in these tempos and stuff, how would they maybe discover that they need to add in sort of this work and stop doing as much of that, um, you know, kind of fast stuff right now? Yeah. Well, if you had a stride power meter, you certainly could, I'm, you know, I'm helping you out there, but I, I totally believe in stride products. I use the power assessment all the time and I profile because it's far more accurate than using GPS. So uh, you can set up, you know, set up time trials um, to determine how your, what your power profile is, whether you're dropping off significantly. If you don't have a stride power meter, then you got to go on a, a, a measured course and you can't, uh, you can't have something like wind be a factor. Now, stride power meters will help you adjust for wind. So even if you're out there doing a 10-mile road time trial and you happen to have a wind at your back or in your face, or if you're going up a little hill or down a little hill or it varies, it doesn't matter because the power is power and the power will adjust. Even though you're going faster down the hill, right, the power will drop because you're really not producing as much force into the ground. Right. And even though you're going slower up the hill or into the wind, the power will adjust and show that you're actually generating more power or force into the ground, even though your GPS pace is going down. So if you got the power mirror, yeah, you can uh, you can use that uh, in any context, whether it's on a, a measured trail or, or a measured road or wherever. If you don't, then you better be running on something like a track or, or circle loop. You know, you might set up a thousand meters or a one mile loop in your neighborhood that's safe away from traffic and you're constantly running on that. So so the the as a general rule, and it, it's not 100 percent, but any cancel any wind help one direction will be somewhat cancel the other. Now, the research shows that it actually doesn't make up for it 100 percent. But it's better than just running in one direction, a time trial. And you should be doing a variety of time trials if you're not racing. You should go out and maybe 10 miles is too far for you as a recreational runner. If I were you, I would just set up, you know, like a six, six or seven mile course, maybe a 10K course, as opposed to an elite runner. You know, they might do a 10 mile time trial or a 10 mile at, at, at just below 100% effort. I've I've for many years always said, run it at 97%. Doesn't matter if you're doing a mile time trial, two mile time trial, 10 mile, run it at 97% because you can predict with fairly good accuracy what 100% would be without absolutely gutting yourself. And it's very difficult, very, very difficult to run 100% effort by yourself, right? So the, the, the anxiety is lowered also. When you're thinking to yourself, I'm just going to do a 97% effort time trial, and then I'll estimate what a 100% is. For example, a lot of my high school kids, I'll have them do a 2,000 meter time trial. For example, in the winter time, when they're not racing for a while, mm -hmm. for a couple purpose. One, and I'll tell them 97% effort. By the way, they'll run a 97% effort, and they let's say they run uh, so, uh, 530. They're a, an elite high school runner. I coach several elite high school runners. They run five minutes, 30 seconds, and they're at sea level. And they say, I could have ran 525. Good. Now we use 525 as the absolute maximum, right, reference for now. And we put it into the Tim Man calculator and see what our training paces are. And we also scroll down and we look on the Tim Man calculator and see what our equivalencies are. So 530, well, actually 525 now predicts I can run a mile in, in 422. Uh, 1600 meters in 422 or whatever it is and a 3200 in whatever time that is say 930 that gives you a benchmark of where you are right and then you might uh four weeks later or three weeks later run an 800 meter time trial okay and see how it matches up now matches up not only in the equivalency tables but from your personal history let me give you an example reed fisher on my team is a marathon runner very, very good long distance runner. Now he'll admit readily that he doesn't have a lot of top end speed. 
And he's not embarrassed by that. That's just his profile because his muscle fiber type is different than, than some of the guys that are quicker, right? He has a lot of more type one endurance, slow twitch muscle fibers. And uh, that's what makes him a great long distance. One of the things that makes him a long distance runner, right? He can sustain a, a high pace uh, just below his max for a very, very long period of time, provided he's training, trained properly. Reed would fall apart if he were given 400 and 800 meter intervals as his main training stimulus all the time with lower volume. He could not succeed on 60 miles a week and, and 12 times 400. He would run like 64 minutes in the half marathon as opposed to 61 and change. Right? Okay. So um, understanding your personal history is part of the assessment, right? Part of the assessment and valuation design, right? If you're a high school kid and you will focus mostly on the 3200, and let's say you're 940, which is 70 seconds a lap, when you're in your top shape and you run 940, what do you usually um, run in the 800? Well, maybe you run two minutes and two seconds, okay? So that's kind of your benchmark. So you go out there in the off season, you run something that gives you an indicator of close to what your two mile is capable of. Maybe you run at 97% effort and you say, and you come out at 950. You're like, you know what? 97% effort, 950 by myself. I'm at least 940 shape when I'm in a race, maybe 936. And then two weeks later or a week later, you run the 800 time trial as part of a workout. You don't use that as the only thing. Right, you do a thorough race warm up. You run an 800 meter time trial. See where you are, and maybe you run 208. Oh, okay. You ran a 950. You run a 208. Maybe the max you could have gone in competitions 206. Right now, uh, you're probably okay. Normally, you're in not 202 when you're in top shape. You're a 206 equivalent, and you're eight weeks away from the racing season. Now, four weeks from the racing season, maybe you do the same thing. You do another two-mile time trial, and you run at 944 this time at 97% effort. You think in the race, maybe 932, 934. So I'm making progress endurance-wise. week later, or at the end of the week, you run an 800-meter time trial, and now you're 204. You know what? You're on track. Now you're four weeks away from the racing season. Now what if you're still 206, but your endurance is better? Then you have to make a judgment call or your coach has to make a judgment call. Do we need to add a little more short quality in there? Right? Because we're now four weeks away from the racing season. But you also really should keep in mind how far are you away from your championship event? Because if the racing season is starting in four weeks, but your championship event is in 12 weeks, and you're only four seconds off where you need to be in the 800, probably shouldn't rush it. Just let that kind of development it, come over the normal training season too. Yeah, it will happen once you start racing on the track. Right when your actual season starts. Right now, if you're four weeks away from the end of the season, you're part with you're three quarters away through the season or two thirds away through the season, and you're still at two oh six. And you and your coach better decide. You better do some three hundred meter repeats, maybe four or five of them, mm -hmm. and then still do your long intervals or whatever because you're a thirty two hundred meter person or your tempos and keep up your distance work. The mistake is to is to fall prey to the conventional models of, of this inverse relationship between volume and intensity. That is the huge mm -hmm. mistake that is made all the time. And unfortunately, too many coaches were convinced of that because of previous models that were taught to them mm -hmm. at coaching clinics. But the problem is the model is not wrong it's just applied to the wrong people. Mm. The model is good for the 400 meter, 800 meter runner. Mm -hmm. You see, you start out with volume at the early part of the developmental phase, less intensity. Mm -hmm. And then as time goes on, you start switching. Mm -hmm. So by mid season, you're kind of mid midway between the highest volume you do and the highest intensity you do. And by the end of this season for a 400 meter, 800 meter runner, you need to be lower volume, and higher intensity, mm -hmm. simply because the greatest factor at that point is your power and your economy. Mm -hmm. The economy meaning the amount of energy required for you to get that speed. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, it can it can be measured in oxygen, but it can be measured in kilocalories, mm -hmm. but it can be measured in other ways. With stride power meters, you can actually measure it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that model of inverse relation between volume and intensity does not work for the vast majority of anybody who anybody who runs the mile or longer. Right. Now there are a few milers that have the good fortune, the blessing of having a huge heart and a high VO2 max as a consequence, because 75% of your VO2 max is determined by your heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other 25% is muscle oxidative capacity, mm -hmm. blood volume is part of it, capillary density, mitochondrial right, right. capacity, on and on and on. Right. Okay, but throwing away the exception of the kid who can run lower volume and still succeed in the mile, the mm -hmm. vast majority of people that want to run in the mile need a medium high volume mm -hmm. most of the season and only a slight reduction just prior to their main event. Mm -hmm. Because if they do this inverse relationship model that's for, that's good for 400, 800 meter runners and keep dropping their volume throughout the season and increasing their intensity, they will start to lose their endurance and stamina. Mm -hmm. Endurance meaning the ability to run long at a lower intensity right. or stamina, the ability to run at a medium distance at a medium high intensity. Mm -hmm. They will lose those two because of the total volume there is dropping mm -hmm. and they're getting away from longer intervals, say three, four, five minute intervals, mm -hmm. which are golden, golden for developing stamina, mm -hmm. right? Think of stamina as the ability to run about half an hour really well. Right, right. Right, mm -hmm. that's a really good benchmark. And it's a, right. it's, it's something that, that can be as relatable to a wide variety of people. Mm -hmm. It's the reason I picked it a long time ago. Right, right. Uh, the world class TV. runner, mm -hmm. the world class runner, they think, okay, my 10k, 12k type ability, right? Mm -hmm. The 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 kid that runs six minutes for the mile, mm -hmm. if their coach is teaching them properly, right? Six minutes for the mile and, and 12:30 for the two mile. Well, their half their half hour racing speed that's like four to five miles. Mm -hmm. OK, but the time is the big factor that they need to keep in their mind as a coach and as an athlete. OK, is my half hour racing ability good? Mm -hmm. Because if it's if it's in, eroded and you're you're six weeks out from the, the end of the track season, it's eroded. If you no longer can go out and do, say, a five mile uh, run really f at, at the same fast pace you were four weeks prior earlier in the season. Mm -hmm. yeah, you are in trouble, right? And let me give you let me give you a historical perspective on mm -hmm. this. Somebody who brilliantly understood this was Arthur Lydiard mm -hmm. from a long time ago. For those mm -hmm. of you who are younger and don't understand, Arthur Lydiard was was a, a runner coach from New Zealand who developed an understanding based on Coach Webb and a couple other people prior to him that endurance was a big factor. OK, mm -hmm. and so what happened was he developed the concept of doing a lot of aerobic endurance training so that your fitness was so high that once you started doing quality training, meaning short repetitions at faster speed, you could do a lot more of them mm -hmm. without breaking down and recover better from them. OK, but one thing that most people don't get about Arthur Lydiard's concepts is that he did time trials. Now, mm -hmm. note, he didn't have runners do them all out. Mm -hmm. He had them do equivalent to about what I do, 97%. Right. Right? He called it seven eight efforts based on Swedish coach Gosta Holmer's charts. Mm -hmm. He did assign training paces as a general. People think that he didn't, but he did. He had charts from Gosta Homer. I could go over that some other time. <laughs> and it's very extensive. Mm -hmm. Bill Bowerman from Oregon had the same charts, mm -hmm. as well as Bill Dellinger, who used those charts extensively, right, at the University of Oregon for many years. Okay. Gosta Homer was a brilliant man ahead of his time. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Lydiard would do things like, okay, you are a miler. Peter Snell, Murray Halberg, mm -hmm. okay, John Davies, all the great elites he coached. He would yeah. say, you're a miler. I still want to know. We're four weeks out from the from the Olympics. Mm -hmm. I want to know what your endurance is like. Yes, we did a big 
10 week base uh, marathon conditioning phase, which is what he called it. Mm -hmm. Then we went to Hills. We mm -hmm. kept a long run in. We did drop the volume a little bit. We started doing some introductory 400 meters fast, 400 meters slow, or a 200 meter fast, 200 meters slow. A lot of people don't realize that he borrowed that from um, Franz Stomfel, mm -hmm. okay, who is a great coach who coached Roger Bannister, Chataway, Brasher, all those guys. Right. And he did not do, and, 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 and the brilliance of later years, he followed a good concept, a good model of Franz Stoffel, who said, no, you don't need to run a fast 400 and then take short recovery jog. No, he had Bannister do a full 440 jog recovery in mm -hmm. two and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Lydiard did the same thing. Because Lydiard said, look, this is a model. He was smart. He was a mm -hmm. practical guy. Not super well educated from a from a, a conventional system, but mm -hmm. very astute. Mm -hmm. and could observe the other people. What work, right. right? He's very much like Bill Bowerman. He was mm -hmm. eclectic. Bowerman always said the best coaches borrow the best models and fine-tune them, okay, and integrate them and basically adjust them to the individuals on the team. Mm -hmm. Because as an example, Bill Maher, I know I'm segueing, but Bill Bowerman, I told my guys the other day, in the early 60s when he had his team that set the four-by-one mile world record, when they set it down in New Zealand, mm -hmm. they raced people like um, uh, Lydiard's athletes, and they mm -hmm. won, they set the world record. Three of the four guys were sub-four-minute milers on cinders, mm -hmm. like Rothko, Devine, and a couple others. But he trained all three of those sub-four-minute milers differently. In fact, he had four guys. One, the, the slowest guy was like a 403. They all were trained differently. Mm -hmm. But they all ran about the same mile time. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he did the same thing as Lydiard. He profiled. Bowerman also had people like his milers do a two-mile time trial throughout the fall and winter. Right. Two-mile time trial about every three weeks or something like that. He would do that, and then three weeks later, he might do an 880, 880 yards or half-mile time trial. Mm -hmm. Well, Lydiard would do the same thing in the lead up to the world of the Olympic Games, he'd mm -hmm. say, okay, John Davies, go run, uh, run a 5K at 97% at effort. He called it seven eighths effort. Mm -hmm. Basically, it was maybe 10 seconds slower, 15 seconds slower than all out, mm -hmm. just to see what his endurance was. So for a minor like John Davies, who got third in the Olympics, silver medal or bronze medal, he if if if, if his 5K time was solid four weeks out. At seven eighths effort, then Lydia knew your endurance is still good. Mm -hmm. But if the if, but if 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 J. Davies struggled, mm -hmm. they said, you know what? We need we, you're you don't need to be doing a whole bunch more four fast four hundreds. Mm -hmm. We need to get you back and do some eight hundreds and get out there and do a ten mile tempo run. He didn't call it tempo then, but it was the same concept. Right. 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 And then he would have them do an under distance, just like Bowerman, an under distance. Lydia would have them do an under distance. Okay, let's do a 330-yard time trial. Mm -hmm. Brilliant, right? Which we call 300 meters now. Okay, <laughs> maybe the endurance was good for John Davis in a 5K, but his 330 was not so good. Right. So we're four weeks out. Lydia's like, not a problem. I'm going to do some 150 meters fast reps and get you a little more speed. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it, this all relates to the average runner as well, whether right. you, or or the non elite, I should say, mm -hmm. right? Whether you're a high school runner or a recreational runner, you need to do uh, a comprehensive approach. Mm -hmm. You need to use a comprehensive approach to understanding what you need for training at this moment, mm -hmm. with the understanding of how many weeks away you are from your peak event. Mm -hmm. OK, mm -hmm. so you do need to go. I would encourage the average everyday recreational 5K runner during periods when we don't have a pandemic, when they're able to race frequently, right. just to vary their event. Mm -hmm. Run a 10K one week, two weeks later, run a 5K. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe a week later, two weeks later, if they can run a road mile, do it. Mm -hmm. I think another three weeks later, run their 5K. Another two weeks later, run a half marathon or a 15K. Mm -hmm. I really like I really like one hour races mm -hmm. if you can find them. A race that lasts about that long for you mm -hmm. if you want to test your endurance, because that's the demarcation. That's a separate separating point in my mind between mm -hmm. stamina and endurance. If you run a one hour race, roughly. And it's subpar, then you need more endurance work. You need mm -hmm. to back out the intensity and do more distance work. Even if it's slow, it will help you. Mm -hmm. Slow down, run more, 
if your one hour is bad. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like one hour is enough for people, no matter what kind of distance they're training for, let's say like around 5k to above where they could run it and be able to put in a good effort, but it wouldn't beat them up too much. Like that might be a concern for somebody to, Oh, I don't want to alter my training, but you're, you, you would be an advocate for saying one hour is not enough to, it's not the same as a marathon or not the same as running even like a, a half marathon for an athlete that might run 90 minutes for a half marathon or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it goes back to my concept that you must, must always think about the duration of the event, mm -hmm. not the distance. It mm -hmm. is absolutely the wrong strategy mm -hmm. to think about the distance of the event in terms of setting up your training and trying to equate training methods among people on the same team. Mm -hmm. I always give the example uh, of, of the old models being wrong about uh, aerobic and anaerobic. And this mm -hmm. relates to how you train. Mm -hmm. The old models said that the mile was 50% aerobic and 50% anaerobic. And I, the very first thing I said when I saw this, you know, I was a sophomore in high school, I was taking biology. I said to Mr. Hine, I said, Mr. Hine, how can that be possible? Because somebody might be a four minute miter, somebody might be six and somebody might be an eight minute miter, or maybe even slower. Mm -hmm. How can it possibly be that everybody is 50% aerobic and 50% anaerobic? I can understand, I said back then in my preliminary thing, why somebody who's running closer to the four minute mark might be quite a bit more anaerobic. And mm -hmm. I don't believe this 50 50. I don't mm -hmm. believe it one bit. I think it's more mm -hmm. like 75 25 mm -hmm. for a four minute miter. And turns out that. Uh, research later confirmed I was pretty darn close mm -hmm. because the research shows it's 75 to 84, depending upon which which type of athlete you're using, mm -hmm. um, whether they have more speed or whether they have more endurance. Okay. Right. Which goes back to the point, you know, so two people training, training for the mile and they're both four minute capability. One might be um, using 84% as an average when he runs a four minute mile. One might be running 75% as an average aerobic contribution mm -hmm. because he has more fast fibers and he has more anaerobic capacity. Right. So they should have a lot of similar training, but an individualized training for small amounts that help them maximize their innate abilities. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Now, but getting back to one hour, your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you're an average everyday Dean or Joe, that's, that's say only been running a year, mm -hmm. you may run a 10 K in close to an hour. Mm -hmm. You were sedentary most of your life. You took up the sport to get healthy and fit. Maybe your colleagues at work, maybe what for whatever reason you were inspired to get moving. Mm -hmm. It may take you almost an hour to run a 10K. Mm -hmm. And so therefore the 10K event is a perfect assessment of your aerobic endurance. Mm -hmm. Whereas an elite runner like Reed Fisher can run at 61 and change. For a half marathon. For a half distance. marathon. Right. So doubling, right. So, more than doubling the distance. Yeah. So, yes, that is a, a wonderful assessment for him. Now, mm -hmm. if you're not racing, or even if you are racing and you just want to run the 10K, let's say you're an every, every day Jane or Joe, um, and you've been running 5Ks, mm -hmm. you can jump in a 10K and not have to run it all out. Right. You can run it at 97% and predict. And the beauty of running 97% is after uh, for a 10K, for an hour person who runs in an hour, it's four or five days later, they're totally recovered. Right. Whereas that last three percent yep. <laughs> might be two weeks. Right, right. But then they right. try and jump in and do a workout, you know, four days later, five days later, and then it ends up setting them negative down the road. But advocating they for all momentum. They yeah. can't keep the ball rolling. Right. Keep the ball rolling. Exactly. Right. You exactly. can't do it. It's very easy. It's very easy to recover from a, a, a time trial that's 97% effort. If you do 90, if you focus on 97% effort, you will find that you, typically it's actually about 5% slower than all out mm -hmm. as a general rule for most people. Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect between the effort and mm -hmm. the actual percentage. Mm -hmm. They don't perfectly match up. Right. So if you're thinking that, if you really think of it that way, that really you're running about 5% slower than all out, even though it feels like 97%, mm -hmm. it, it really does help you understand that you can recover very fast from that submaximal time trial effort and get back to normal training. Mm -hmm. So that might be something for um, like a practical application for this scenario is maybe somebody's running with stride, maybe they're not. You look at, you know, maybe 
a recent all out race that you've done and you scale that back, like you mentioned, like 5% in terms of the pace or the power, and that's going to be maybe, maybe a target that somebody can add, um, you know, maybe two weeks from now, if they decide to do a 10 K at, add in that, uh, you know, that 97% effort, but have a real number to, to go off of if they're not very good at running by feel yet. Right. Well, you know, the beauty of the stride power meter is it will tell you if you ran 97% effort, I, I can tell you that very closely, you are about 5% below in power from where you can be actually at all out at that moment. Yep. So if you run, for example, a 5k and you run it at 97% effort, and let's say your time is 17 minutes, mm -hmm. and you look down and hold on a second real quick. Do some quick math. You are approximately five watts per kilogram for your body weight, mm -hmm. okay? 5.086, mm -hmm. okay? That's very close to what you are. So let's say you weigh 154 pounds, that's 70 kilograms, 5.086 times 70. So all out, you're 356 watts, mm -hmm. okay? You ran that at 97% effort, but really it was about 95% power. So take 356.02 divided by 0.95 because it's inversely proportional mathematically. That means your max is 374.76. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now you can use 374.76 as your target two weeks from now when you run all out in the 5K. Right. And you have so that you look confidence. At your watch. Right. If you got a watch that shows power actively in the live status, mm -hmm. you look for 374. Now that's what you want to average. Mm -hmm. I'd suggest the best racing strategy is start below that, mm -hmm. move up to it, and finish beyond it. So right. maybe you start at 368 while it's in the early going. Mm -hmm. Re disregarding everybody else in the, in the race who doesn't understand how to pace themselves <laughs> well and to use their energy capable uh, user power well, mm -hmm. you know, in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You just pay attention to your watch, you run 368 the first kilometer. And then you gradually ease it up to 371 by the second kilometer. By the third kilometer, you want to be at 374. Mm -hmm. By the fourth kilometer, you want to be 377 or 8. And by the fifth kilometer, you want to go for broke, and you're probably 381, mm -hmm. something like that. And you've enabled yourself the ability to close well because you That's understood right. the target. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. That's absolutely right. Now, if you were to check your pace and if you were on a perfectly flat course and you didn't have any wind factors, yeah, you will find that your pace. Um, let's see. It's about like 330 kilometers or around there, I think. Okay. So that's roughly. Yeah. Let's say. You would you would probably be in the neighborhood of eight seconds differential mm -hmm. from the first kilometer to if you were put it in per mile context, mm -hmm. you would have a variation of roughly eight seconds. Mm -hmm. Think of it this way: a world class runner like uh, Kenanisa Buckley, mm -hmm. right when he was running twelve thirty seven thirty five. Okay, that's uh, you know roughly four hundred three a mile, four hundred one and change per sixteen hundred. Okay, what does he do? He goes out in about 231 per kilometer, mm -hmm. right? And he keeps steady on that. He might go 230. In the, I have it actually. I used to have it on my wall when I lived in both sides. <laughs> the exact all since the 1960s, every mm -hmm. single 5K, I probably have it in my file somewhere, every single 5K world record, 5,000 meter world. Technically, 5K is on the road. 5,000 right. meters. 5, meters. Like you, you know. Right. Okay. All right. So sometimes I kind of get a little picky about it. <laughs> When they say I ran a 5K, was it a, okay? So you ran the road? No, no. <laughs> so it's 5,000 meters because it's precise on the track. Right. No guarantee it was precise on the road. Right. Okay. So if you look at the records from the 1960s to the present, it's a, I recall the percentage being something like 93 or 94 percent of the records were with negative splits, mm -hmm. excluding the first lap, the first kilometer where they might be one second faster. Mm -hmm. So all these top athletes like a Kennedy Sebeckley or Heidi Geber Selassie or people all the way back to, say, Ron Clark, mm -hmm. who ran 13-16 on cinders, which was an amazing performance, mm -hmm. right, in the day <clears throat> with nine kinds of equipment we don't we would we would laugh at now. I mean, right. heavy, their spikes were way heavier than what we have. Right. 
way heavier, not even close. But you, but what if this? This is how they pace. They try to run no faster than their average pace for basically the first four k mm-hmm. of that five k race. First four thousand meters, that five, and the last five thousand meters, they go for broke. Right. That's how they do it, and everybody's like, "Oh, it's because they have great speed." No, that's that's not the reason. Mm-hmm. It's a small reason. What they've done is they know. They've, they've consciously made a decision of pacing in a way that they're they're feeling good enough when they get to the 80% mark of the race, they can pound it. Mm-hmm. Because they know from experience that if you wait until that moment, mm-hmm. you can actually more than make up for being behind, by, behind the average pace. Mm-hmm. I personally learned this with cycling with power meters in the 1990s mm-hmm. before they came out with – with power meters, you know, stride power meters on, for feet, right. uh, for runners. The power meter would tell me if I wanted to do a 20-minute time trial or a six-minute time trial mm-hmm. or a 60-minute time, I did all three of those on a regular basis. I either did a six or seven for max aerobic power. I did a 20-minute as my intermediate prediction, mm-hmm. right? Or I did a 60-minute. Mm-hmm. A lot of times I did a 30-minute too, instead of the 20, because I found it was a better predictor of my stamina than 20 minutes. Right. Okay. What I found was every single time that I went for broke too early, mm-hmm. I slowed down no matter how, how how much I wanted to do well. Right. I could not hold it despite my d- intense desire to do well. Mm-hmm. All right. I say this happens all the time with other people in their regular running events. Mm-hmm. For basically anything over three minutes, you run, need to run with a strategy of holding back until you're 75 or 80 percent of the way into it, and then gun it. Right, and consciously that your, hold that. That will be your best strategy. Right. What people don't realize is if, if a world class marathoner, they watch somebody uh, in the Boston or, or or something. Let's say take New York City as an example. New York City marathon or Chicago. Mm-hmm. What happens often is you'll see world class marathoners running their first four miles at just a hair over five minutes pace. Yeah. Yep. The people's like, well, they all, the, the commentators will, will sometimes <laughs> pick up on it. But more times than not, they'll just like, oh, well, they're running slow. They're, they're kind of looking at each other. They're kind of, you know, waiting for somebody else to go. Mm-hmm. And that may be the case, but I think more times than not, they're smart. Mm-hmm. They know, hey, Two hours and six or seven or eight minutes is a long time to be running hard. You can't go for broke early on because you deplete all your carbohydrate stores, your glycogen. Right. And you won't be able to finish strong. You slow down. Right. So what do they do? They use the first 20 to 30 minutes as an extended warm up mm-hmm. because all they did prior to the marathon was jog 10 minutes at about nine minutes a mile because mm-hmm. they wanted to burn 100 percent fat. Mm-hmm. Right. Whether they knew the physiology or not, they understood the practicality. So they use the first, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so as a warm up. Mm-hmm. What does the average date Jane or Joe do when they run the marathon? They go right out their target pace right away right. when they shouldn't. Right. They should go 20 or 30 seconds slower. Right. Maybe 30 seconds slower in the first mile, then 20 seconds slower in the second mile, third mile, about 10 seconds slower, then the fourth mile, five seconds slower, then the fifth mile, finally close to their average pace. Mm-hmm. And then what's going to happen is if they do this, they'll be able to later on in the race have sufficient energy, mm-hmm. meaning glycogen storage, to be able to close hard. Sure. I've had, literally had marathon runners that were, say, three-hour marathon runners, okay, train with me, use the strategy, go out in about 20 seconds to 30 seconds slower in the first few miles. Mm-hmm. And, and, and they 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 trusted me. But normally they would never have even tried such a strategy. They thought it would be dumb to be behind pace. But they trusted me, thank goodness, and they held back. What Mm -hmm. ended up happening? It just happened here this winter when one one guy ran. Okay? He ended up closing the last three miles about 12 seconds a mile, eight, then 12, then like 14 seconds a mile, Mm -hmm. faster than his average on the last three miles, and hit a new best. He had a six-minute PR. Wow. Yeah. Okay, no, I, so he just I'm, kept I'm bringing it down, and, and over the last half marathon, he was consistently three, four, five, six seconds a mile, and, and getting better than is what he thought he could do before. Mm-hmm. This is possible. You run a five k, and you want to run average six minutes, six minutes a mile. 
man, don't run fast to say 555 or six on that first mile. Right. Don't do it. Right. My friend John Steiner always says, you know, go out in what you know you go out in the pace or power you know you can handle, mm -hmm. you've done previously and, and and proved to yourself, and then come back, meaning finish stronger than what you actually can. He right. does it with rowing now. He was mm -hmm. a former runner for many, many years, and he does rowing at power meters all the time. Mm -hmm. He's been doing it for the last 15 years, and he and I have come to the same conclusion. Go out at a below your target and finish faster than your target. Right. By the way, I use the same concept in interval training or fartlek training or whatever with my athletes. Right. If I tell you you're supposed to average 5K pace in the workout, but your current 5K, not your goal, but right. your current 5K pace is, then you're going to start your first few reps slower than your 5K pace. Mm -hmm. Then you go towards the 5K pace in the middle. And if all is going well and you're feeling great, you'll finish a little faster than mm -hmm. or with a little more power than right. your 5K pace or power. Right. right? That's how you should do it. Right. You will be successful nine out of ten times doing that way. Now, if you go with the, oh, well, I, I've ran, I ran uh, five minutes a mile in my 5K, okay? And if you go out there and start doing repeat miles, let's say repeat half miles, sorry, mm -hmm. at 226 as you want to, you know, I'm going to run my goal pace. And you go right away at 226. You've got a 30 or 40% chance you'll have a good workout. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Instead of starting – just below that and 32 right to 232 right right because you know you can run five minutes a mile start at 232 right right and all goes well you're at 231 or 230 in the second rep mm -hmm. and by the sixth rep you've actually used an extended warm-up you didn't you weren't too aggressive you'll finish all six of your reps mm -hmm. which is a, an important stimulus for improving improving your physiological capacity. Right. You need to finish the volume at that given intensity. And what will happen is you start at 232, you'll end up at 224, feeling good, right. feeling great, and you're I under control. Like you would you have been. 226, right. you might be able to do, if you have everything perfectly dialed in for the few days before that, you got all your sleep dialed in perfectly, your hydration, your fueling of carbohydrates, the stress in your life is low, you don't have anything that's stressing you out, mm -hmm. it's external from running, okay? But your chance, chances are you'll probably go 226, 226, 228, 231, 236. Right. And you end up finishing the workouts in the mid-230s, and you hate yourself. Right. You think you're a loser. Right? Runners are hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of athletes are. Mm -hmm. But endurance athletes are very hard on themselves. One of the things that makes an endurance athlete great is their intense passion and motivation. Mm -hmm. It helps them get out there and do all the work that's necessary to be successful. It's why they're not, no offense, but then it's not why they're not a sprinter. <laughs> right. Different different mindset between the two. Right. For sure. It's not to put sprinters down, but they have a completely different mentality. Right. And then the sprinter can get away with skipping workouts because they only really need a couple fast ones a week. Right. And they can goof off the rest of the time and they know it. It's also why high school coaches want to race often. Why it's conventional is is to have a lot of track meets. Mm -hmm. It's because sprinters don't like to train. They love to compete. Mm -hmm. But so training. if you have two or three track meets a week, that serves as workouts. That's why the East Coast is in love with racing. <laughs> Because if they didn't have it, nobody would be training. No sprinter right. would train. Right. It would take off the entire winter and never improve. Right. Totally. But the coaches race them every single week. Right. Or even twice a week. So right. that they get a bunch of good quality training and their sprinters thrive on. It doesn't help the distance runners. It's actually deleterious to the distance runners, but it helps the sprinters. I know we went way off track. But oh, no, it's great. Um, I, I'm sure people find a ton of wealth out of it. So I I, I love listening and talking about it. Um, we do have a couple of listener questions that kind of trickled in. Uh, and I wanted to ask you this one first. This is from uh, Steve Palladino. And he says, uh, can you please have Tom talk a bit about mixed intensity workouts. So some people out there, you know, in the running world are familiar with um, just kind of general structure of how different coaches and different groups 
structure their training, but um, maybe this would be a, yeah, a good time for you to talk about mixing intensity with workouts because maybe the regular, um, you, know, you know, the regular recreational runner, amateur runner isn't familiar with the concept, but uh, maybe you can talk a mm -hmm. little bit about your, your system and how you do that. Sure, sure. And that's a great co uh, question by a, a great coach. Mm -hmm. Coach Palladino is a good coach. <laughs> Okay, the concept is the important first is the important starting point. The concept that I originated back in the 1980s is simple. It doesn't take much to get the effect. Mm -hmm. Right? Take a look at mileage as, as, as an example away from say the quality that Coach Palladino was talking about. We know, we know from research that if you run roughly 25 miles per week, you're going to have about a 25% improvement in your endurance. That's pretty close. When you double your mileage to 50, you have half of that. And then when you double it again, another half. You see how you lose as you double increase the amount. That was my concept. I noticed, for example, that if I ran as a 14 year old, that if I went from three miles per day all the way up to six miles per day, I really improved my performance a lot in the 10K road races I was doing. But I noticed when I would go up even to nine miles, I would try to do nine miles when I was 14, 15 years old, the improvement was a small amount. And so it, it, it occurred to me that we can get a lot for a little. Taking this now into the realm of interval training, which was in my understanding at the time of something that I wanted to evaluate, my understanding was that if I ran six quarters, six times a quarter on the, uh, during the track season or whatever, I would have a certain amount of improvement, say three seconds in my mile time or three seconds per lap. Okay. But what if I did 12? I might only improve one second by doubling it, but I increased my injury rate by three or four times. Okay, so maybe a happy medium is what I was thinking. Maybe, maybe somewhere between the six and twelve is just right. And what if and that concept applies to all of the interval training realm? There's a certain point where you have diminishing returns. More reps is not necessarily better. So if it's possible, for example, let's use VO2 max as an example. If it's possible to get all the benefits for the individual by running five times 800 for that person. Let's say the, the person that runs uh, runs them in 230. That's their VO2 max, something they can run for six, seven minutes all out. Why do we need to do, have them do six, seven, eight repetitions of 800 when five gets, gets the job done? Okay. If we get to the point where we've run all five of them and we've derived all the benefits before we have diminishing returns, can we not add on shorter quality, quality, maybe 200 meter repeats to work on speed development, speed endurance, something to that effect, right? Because we still have the capacity to do eight, seven, six, seven, eight times 800, don't we? So let's stop at five and use the extra energy we would have had to run seven or eight reps to run some 200s or some hill repeats or something else or some short sprints, okay? So I'm just saying that we tend to think that we just got to add more, do as many repetitions as we possibly can handle at that intensity and keep going with that intensity. I say, wait, well, hey, maybe two thirds of the way through the maximum you can do, that's enough because you've got all the benefits. You've stimulated your body's you know, various systems to develop all the effects. So let's add on something else. That was kind of my concept in, back in the day. And it's, 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 it's proved to be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so then the key to, the, to applying the concept is saying, look, I don't need to have separate workouts. I don't need to do repeat 800s on Tuesday at 2.30. And then on Friday, I need to do 12 200s in 30 seconds. I can combine it and say, I'll stop it. At, uh, instead of doing six 800s, I might do four 800s on Tuesday and then add on six 200s. And what, what you're also doing is simulating what happens in a race. Right. Because you close fast. 
right? Right. Well, and that's the goal for starting a little bit below, like pr practicing everything in the entire system is in encouraging it. If you don't have that ability, like you're writing in the training to be able to close fast, then you can't possibly run at that just below the effort and then at the end start to crank it up. So it's tying it all together. Exactly. Yeah. And and and, and it's very possible. I do it all the time um, with my athletes dependent upon what part of the developmental phase, whether they're six months or three months away from their target event or six six weeks away, I restructure the order of it. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily do all the slow reps at first and all the fast reps at the end. Right. That is the best approach, in my view, if you lack endurance, lack stamina. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, the generic understanding is among my elite athletes, we're focusing on uh, strength, sure. strength, 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 because that's a conventional understanding. And that's right. totally fine, mm -hmm. right? So the strength approach is we do the longer repetitions at slower paces early in the workout, and we do the shorter repetitions, whether they're on the flat track or up a hill or whatever mm -hmm. you decide to do at the end. Okay, that's a strength approach that works fantastic because it that basically serves the purpose of base training. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. It sets the base. Yeah. For it. I've had several sprint coaches right away say to me, "How come you don't put or sprint coaches who end up becoming uh, put into the role of having to coach distance runners sure. in high school or college teams?" Because I've been an advisor to a lot of university run, uh, coaches, and they will ask me, "How come you don't put speed first? Because when they start off." At the beginning of the race, they're going out fast. I said, well, first of all, you're making the assumption that putting this, some speed at the end of a workout, like I do with the strength approach, somehow is not going to help you at the start of a race. Right. It is. Right. It is. And you don't have to sprint maximum at maximum speed to get speed benefits. Mm -hmm. You don't. Right. Okay, probably for a distance runner, no, they never need to run all out. They need to no, go no faster than 400 meter speed ever. Because what you're doing is increasing the risk of injury enormously by right. going with maximum sprint. And they never get to even 400 meter speed, hardly ever, right. during a race, right? Cross country races. Let me give you an example. If you raced effectively in a 5K cross country race and you're a high school kid, you raced effectively, meaning you, you didn't go out at an insanely fast pace like and follow the pack, and you just ran your own steady pace that you could hold and gradually got to the, you know, gradually maybe ramped it up a little bit or held the fastest even pace you could mm -hmm. and then started coming down, uh, increasing the speed the last kilometer. What you'll find is you can run the last 30 to, 30 to 60 seconds, depending upon – how many races you've done mm -hmm. last 30 to 60 seconds, you will run at your one mile racing speed. Mm -hmm. I have literally timed even collegiate runners in the last 400 meters of their, of their eight or 10 K race. And they never exceed their mile speed. Right. Never. But if you asked them at the race, how fast were you running? They, <laughs> Oh, I was running maximum speed. Do you realize you never even broke one mile race speed the last quarter mile? Right. Okay, 5K, you watch high school 5K guys, they never run faster than the last quarter mile. They never break one mile racing speed average. Right. Now, if they waited until 200 meters to go, they might run the last 200 meters at closer to 800 meter racing speed. Mm -hmm. So really a high school, I always say a high school kid, you don't need to run faster than 800 probably. You know, if you're doing if you're doing 200 meter reps, four of them, mm -hmm. four four two hundreds at 800 meter speed is plenty of speed training because you're not going to go faster than that during a five cross country season, right? Right. And even even a kid who runs the 1600 meters in high school, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say he's a 440 kid and he runs 70 per lap, right? If he paces himself and doesn't go out in 66 or 65, which is which is not as not not a good strategy, but he right. goes out pretty close to 70, maybe 69 and change. Then he's 70 and then he's 71 and change. He gets to the last lap. He'll probably run at 68, something like that. Right. But really it's over the last 200 that he's mm -hmm. picking it up. Right. Right. Cause he starts kicking too soon. He can't hold it and he slows down. Right. But he's not even going faster than his 800 meter speed. His last, his last 200, if he's really good, is 33. Mm-hmm. 
right? Right. Well, that's his 800 meter speed. Right. You see? Yeah. Okay. I don't yeah. know. How I segued in onto that, but yeah, I'm no. always reminded of these kinds of concepts when when questions are asked. That, yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're trying to figure out how to practically apply them. Right. Um, I hopefully answered Coach Palladino's uh, question there. Yeah. Uh, to and I some degree. Wondered- I'd want like addition onto that uh, when people maybe look at a, a system and they say, oh, it's mixed intensity. It's not every workout and every single, uh, you know, hard and intense day is a mixed intensity session. Like the long run doesn't also always include like hard stuff at the end. Like you're not mixing stuff all the time. It's just workouts that you've selected and sessions that you've selected are reserved mm-hmm. for that specific structuring of having that mixed intensity. Yeah, and my rule of thumb has always been twice per week. Right. So if if you're not training for the marathon under me, you're training for a half marathon and below. As a general rule, you're going to do a Tuesday workout, a Friday workout, a Sunday long run. Right. Or if you have religious convictions, it might be Monday, mm-hmm. Thursday, Saturday, Saturday, something like that. Right. Well, oh, the long run is the general rule when you're um, not training for the marathon. You're not training for events that are longer than – then uh you know somewhere in the 70 or 80 minute range if you're not training for events longer than that then there's no need really as a general rule to run your just long runs fast right right and it just and, and the main reason is Evan, mm-hmm. is that i want you to have the sufficient energy to do your other two key workouts say the tuesday friday workout well right, right. i don't want you to do the wednesday uh, sunday long run too fast and then only have 48 hours to bounce back and you do a subpar Tuesday workout. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Totally makes sense. What um, happens is injury rates also go up. You run too fast in your long run on Sunday and say you're a 5K runner. Mm-hmm. If you run too fast on your long run on Sunday, two days later, when you have to do a key workout, let's say the coach prescribes some repeat 800s for you, your legs are stiff still mm-hmm. and your coordination is not there like it mm-hmm. needs to be. Right. And as a consequence, you're trying to hit those times. You're trying to do a solid workout. You're of the belief that I've trained hard. I can get better. Mm-hmm. And the problem is you're pushing through psychologically, pushing mm-hmm. through what your body can't handle. You're mm-hmm. trying to push through, but your body's not not there. It's stiff. It's achy. Um, it's not fluid. And you're using right. bad mechanics, bad form, bad rhythm. And you're certainly not improving your running economy, your efficiency, right. and you're certainly not improving your ability to relax. Right. Which is always what the best runners have going for them when they compete. They make it look easy because they have practiced relaxing mm-hmm. when they're at a high speed. Right. And how are you supposed to relax at a high speed during a workout when you're all stiff and beat up? Right. You yeah. can't. Right. Yeah, totally. You simply, you, you simply can't. Yeah. Um, we have also, a, it's also why Evan I say run slowly on your on your days, days between your key workouts. Right. It, and Drew and I were talking extensively about this this morning via chat. Mm-hmm. Or not talking, but communicating. And Drew is I, Drew Hunter, who is fantastic, fantastic runner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we were going off because Drew is is not just a runner, but he's a guy much like the rest of the guys on my team who who's a thinker. He mm-hmm. wants to understand more and more and more and more how all these principles, concepts, physiology uh, terms, and so on apply. Mm-hmm. And 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 part of it is his intellectual curiosity, just like the other guys on my team. Part of it is an under is if they f- they can use the information uh, as as they're running workouts. Mm-hmm. I can't run the workouts for them right. as their coach. I can't be their legs. Mm-hmm. They still have to make decisions. If they understand the concepts, they can make on live adjustments, on the go adjustments. Right. And that's what Drew is hunting or Drew is hunting for. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. You know, but we talked extensively this morning about running slowly. Mm-hmm. I said basically the, the norm used to be running six minutes a mile if you're an elite guy on your so-called easy days. Right. But all I say is um, that makes it difficult to run your repeat 400s, 800s, 1200s, or whatever with skill. Mm-hmm. See, the one thing, if, if I really wish I could go back in time and measure the running economy of, of elite, say, in the 70s and 80s, now the people that are applying the concept mm-hmm. 
of going slowly, you would see probably their their um, the amount of oxygen and, and kilocalories they use to run a given speed now is mm -hmm. less than it was then. And that's the major predictor is why they're running faster. Right. It's not that their VO2 max now is higher. Right. And right. it's certainly not that the will will or the, the the mind set now is better than it was then. Right. I would guess the vast majority even say having been around a lot of the guys from the 70s and 80s, they're tough people, right. tough runners. You couldn't be more competitive and driven. And they didn't have money. Mm -hmm. There was no money in this, but they were doing it for the pure love of the sport. Right. Very motivated. Right. Yeah. They were motivated intrinsically. Right. So that wasn't a factor. The one difference is possibly shoe wear. Mm. And certainly now with a, which is a big, if we were big, talking about track spikes and let's say three years ago or five years ago, sure. Track spikes were probably not that much different in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, significantly different than they were five years ago. Mm -hmm. But I would say some of the times have dropped simply because the economy is better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I would I would suggest anybody who's interested in understanding uh, how this concept plays out is look at the research. You can just go on to something like, uh, you know, scholar.google and, and search for running economy mm -hmm. and, and various populations and compare, say, the Kenyans versus the, the Europeans. Mm -hmm. And you will find that people like Dr. Ben Saltine of Denmark, mm -hmm. he's deceased now, one of the best researchers of all time, along with Dr. David Costell. Ben Saltine measured all kinds of Kenyans and all kinds of Europeans and found their VO2 max values were identical, mm -hmm. the top Europeans. The one thing that was different was their running economy. Right. He never ever answered why, <laughs> and I don't think he thought of it. Right. Or it if just... he did, he certainly didn't explain it. Right. I think the major reason, my speculation is, the reason the running economy is so much better than the Kenyan is they ran slowly because of their culture. I've said this several times in recent weeks. People, people have asked me in podcasts or whatever. I said, look, the culture of the, of the Kenyan group is very social, mm -hmm. super social. They're very nice people. Mm -hmm. Hang around them for a while and you'll find out they're incredibly friendly people. Mm -hmm. They believe in being kind to each other. And you will find that they love to socialize on their easy runs, on their non-key workouts. I learned this in Eugene, Oregon. When I lived a quarter mile from Alton Baker Park in apartments, my mm -hmm. wife and I. And I'll go run on the trails. And a few, several days before the Prefontaine, some runners would arrive, Ethiopians and Kenyans, particularly the Kenyans. They arrived on kind of Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay? And Saturday was the race. And they'd, I'd, I could hear them a half mile away chatting on the Alton Baker. It's called, they call it Priest Trail in Alton Baker Park. It's, yep. you know, a few miles around. It's the outer skirt is like three and three quarter miles around. You could hear them a half mile away chatting. Mm -hmm. And I kept turning my head and wondering, where are they? I thought they were right next to me. It sounded like they were on top of me. Right. They would do this for a long period of time. I'd finish up my run. I was like five miles or something. And I'd sit there. And just, you know, on the bridge, and I'd see them go by, and they're chatting. And an hour later, they're still jogging along at eight minutes a mile and chatting, chatting, chatting. It dawned on me, you know what? This is their culture. Mm -hmm. When They're all business when they're on the track and doing their key, faster workout, like at South Eugene High School on Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. Right? I'd see them over there, and they're running repeat thousands in 232, 235, something like that. Right? Or the women were running them in 242. Mm -hmm. But when they're running their easy distance runs, they're really running slowly, and they do, and, and it may be simply from the fact that it's a cultural context, mm -hmm. cult cultural manifestation. Mm -hmm. But that's also why when Ben Saltine measured him, along with people like Dr. Bivrank Bilad and others in Europe, that their economy was so much better. I suggest because they're running slowly on their on their recovery runs, mm -hmm. and so their muscles are not tight when it comes time to do their fast track workouts. Mm -hmm. And so they're running their tra fast track workouts with muscles that are supple, loose, and their stride is fluid. Mm -hmm. And if you do enough track workouts with skill, imagine what it happens. Your energy requirement to run a given pace goes down. So that's why their economy was so much better. People can do all this, oh, they're anthropometrics and they're, they're lower leg, their calf muscles are smaller and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, nah, you know what, that is? that's a small one. 
that's a small reason why. Because I've measured people in the lab who had big calf muscles and a good running economy. Mm-hmm. Okay. But those very same people that I measured in the lab who had running eco- good running economy were ones that were slackers. Uh. <laughs> they didn't they didn't keep up with the pack under easy. They just jogged along. A good example was a guy named Paul Krieger. Mm-hmm. I think it was Paul that I measured. And he had a fantastic economy. He had big calves. He was a steeplechaser. He was from Germany. He was really good. Measured his economy. He was really great. Really great. Huge calves. But what would Paul do? Man, he jogged along like seven and a half, seven minutes a mile was fast for him. On an easy day. On an easy day. The rest of the guys were going 630 pace or something. He didn't keep up with them. He just went off on his own and ran on the trails. He liked being by himself because he didn't want to be pushed. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you another one that had probably great economy back in the day was David Moorcroft of England. Right? Mm-hmm. Right? He ran 13 flat point four two world record, 1982. Okay? He did that in Oslo, Norway. Mm-hmm. That season, he ran a 349.68. He ran a 732 and changed it. In in uh, in White City there or whatever it, what it is I forget the name of the meet in in uh, London uh, he ran a, a one forty six which was his PR in the eight hundred which I find amazing because now he's training to five k and he sets a PR in the eight hundred right. and he sets a PR in the mile and he'd been a miler for many many years before that consistently a three fifty type mile fifty five type miler mm-hmm. training like a miler seventy miles a week and lots of fast four hundreds and and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then, then Dave Anderson, his coach, who was a P, elementary PE teacher, said, look, look, let's move you up to the 5,000. We'll start doing longer repeats, like repeat thousands. We'll bump your mileage up to 90. But what did David Moorcroft do? He would not run. He was in a club, running club. Mm-hmm. He would not run with his teammates on the easy days because he wanted to run along at 630 pace, which was a jog for him. Right. If you're running 13 flat. Yeah. He wouldn't run with them because his quote, it was in the Athletics Weekly, which is a major uh, publication in England, mm-hmm. that they run too dang fast because they're running like 540, 530 pace on their easy days, the rest of the guys. Right. You know, I don't want to do that. Right. I'll tell you another one. I always talked about this to my guys, Arturo Barrios, world mm-hmm. record holder in 10,000 meters. I, I think he still lives in Eugene. I mean, I still lives in Boulder. I'm not sure. Right. He was He trained by himself all the time. He ran out the Boulder Res. Reservoir by himself. He didn't do uh, workouts with other people. He didn't do the discipline with other people. I suggest this because he was super self-aware of what he needed. Right. He didn't want to get caught in the trap of doing too fast runs on his easy days. When when Rob D. Costello lived here, mm-hmm. right? He used great marathoner, wonderful, wonderful mm-hmm. marathoner. Man, he had a whole bunch of 20, 207s to 209s, whole bunch of them. And uh, anyway, he lived in Boulder. He moved from Australia. He moved, lived in Boulder for a few years. He would run super slowly, super slowly. He'd run along 630 a mile. Mm-hmm. I remember when uh, you know Frank Short was in his prime. He was running 630 a mile. Right. Joe Rogers, most of the time, wasn't running that fast on his distance. When he had a key day and he was pushing hard, he was. Just like Frank Short, when he had a key day, he was pushing hard. But I would suggest they had energy in that tank because they weren't beat up for running or distance runs too fast. Right. They so they followed the so-called 80-20 concept all the right. time. They either ran very, very comfortably or they got after it mm-hmm. during the key workout. I want to is- squeeze in. Uh, we, we have time for two more questions. Uh, quick questions. First, uh, this one comes from Ian, but to preface it, um, you do uh, coaching yourself, so you obviously have a group, but you also take online clients. Sure. Uh, and you also coach with Stride, so that's why you've been able to talk about, you know, your mm-hmm. recommendations and stuff. But you are actively uh, taking in clients now too, and you're actively coaching with Stride. So just to let people know that are on the stream watching that. But uh, Ian has a question, um, and we, I think we only have time for two quick ones. Uh, the first one is uh, with your athletes who use Stride. Where does their CV 
align with a percent of their critical power? Is it roughly equal a range or regularly slower or faster? So you, you've talked about CV being that 30 minutes uh, effort, that 30 minute hard effort, and then percent of CP, if people are familiar with stride, um, we use like that auto calculated model. Uh, so it's that that number that just looks at your workout. Um, but how does uh, your your elite athletes or maybe your athletes that use stride, where does your CV align with your critical power? Well, you guys have a different model, and uh, I usually I use ninety percent of the power they can run for seven minutes all out. Mm -hmm. So you have your system set up for that to collect. Yeah, and I use calculus. I use logarithms and exponentials and a multifactorial uh, equation. But uh, I, I typically, for example, will use somebody's five k time because they run it all the time. You know, that's a frequent event in, in America and around the world. And then I do a regression equation, um, nonlinear regression equation to predict what they could run for seven minutes all out. And then I have an equivalency for watts per kilogram because you can't use watts. Right. right? Watts is a good starting point, but you must understand that it's everything is relational. Mm -hmm. Right. On my team, for example, I have uh, my Tim Man Elite team. I have guys ranging from 123 to 167 pounds. Right. Okay. So whatever that is, 53 to I don't know, uh, 73 kilograms off the top of my head, just roughly. Sure. But when you divide when you divide the watts that they uh, produce by their body weight in kilograms, then you then you understand that they're fairly equivalent. Right. They're all very in that close band. Right. But but Sydney on the on our team is quite light. You know, he might train at a full 80 watts lower than somebody like uh, um, like Joey Berry, too, who's one of our bigger runners. Right. Right. Full 80 watts per mile difference. Mm -hmm. OK, so you have to understand that everything should be divided by your body weight in kilograms. And also it might be ex an exponent below that. But that's part of my research. Well, actually, my dissertation, I'm not going to be able to do it what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I just found out that I can't do a laboratory assessment for my doctoral research because of the coronavirus. Right. So uh, either I got to wait all the way till next year, I got to retool and do different research. So I'm going to do, and I'm re bringing this up simply because I'm going to need subjects, uh, participants. I'm going to need recreational runners and elite runners. And I'll probably have to do this outdoors. I was going to do indoor laboratory testing and, and provide a, uh, provide more understanding of the relationship of running economy and uh, an exponent factor. Um, but I'm going to have to do this outdoors. So I'm going to do some time trials outdoors, some short and medium distance time trials. And then I'm going to create an individualized profile. So anybody who participates in my study um, will get an individualized profile and be able to use the um, recommendations to um, adjust their training to their individual needs. Make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's super cool. Um, I have one last question here from Hillgrove cross country coach Jonathan Gambrell. Um, he says, How would you envision using stride pods for an entire high school team just for the top runners? Try for the whole team to use them. But how would you maybe see in a current um, climate how a, a high school coach could, could use stride to their advantage? Well, to some degree, it depends upon the financial capacity of that, uh, you know, district. If if you have, uh, you know, you have upper, upper middle or upper class um, parents that can afford it, then yes, mm -hmm. um, I think because it's not, you know, I mean, we're talking about a technology that it's thousands, hundreds of thousand dollars have been put into developing, so they can't give it away free, okay. But if you have the capacity to buy. Um, to buy the power mirrors, I think it's absolutely wonderful for an entire range of abilities on the team. For one thing, you can, as a coach, dial in. Um, you can connect, I should say. You can connect your concepts that you're trying to teach them about, for example, running really, truly easy on your easy days, you know, to some actual numbers. Mm -hmm. You can show, for example, the kid on the team that's a 24-minute 5K runner that they're running at 80% of their max aerobic power on their easy days when they should be running 60. Right. 
because the power will tell you. And you run out in the grass course or you roll in the undulating course. Jonathan Gambrell is a, is a, is a, is not only a, uh, a good, really good coach in Georgia, but he's also a chemistry teacher. I happen to know Jonathan because we went to, he's a level three USATF endurance coach as well. Um, but he may send his kids out in the rolling hills around Atlanta mm -hmm. and he can show the kids with, with the power meter that, look, you were running about 10% too fast. Right. Right. Your power, I got an instant, I got instant data here that shows, you know, after you get home and upload, it looks like you were running at, at a tempo pace. Mm -hmm. You were supposed to be running easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we need to slow you down. I'm going to figure out ways. If I'm putting myself in Jonathan's shoes. I'm going to put my, I'm going to find ways of slowing down you guys so that you do what's appropriate, relatively appropriate. See the top kids on my team, they really should be running 715 a mile mm -hmm. because they're, because because their power shows that they're running at 60% of their max aerobic power. Their power data shows it. Mm -hmm. But you guys are running eight minutes a mile, lagging behind them, and you're running at 80%. Mm -hmm. You're way too fast. Mm -hmm. I'm going to set up some mechanism to measure it. So I'm going to set up a half-mile loop or a half-mile or a mile loop for mm -hmm. easy runs. And you're going to come by, and I know what you're and, – and you're going to be able to look at your watch and see what your power is, and you're going to yell it out to me. Mm -hmm. And you better be close within five watts of where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Now, Jonathan and I can talk about this, but we can do equation conversion and we'll watch per kilogram and tell you what exactly the power, the right. pace would be on that particular course, whether it's undulating or not. But the power will help guide, mm -hmm. right, guide how you do things, um, whereas the GPS may not be entirely appropriate. Right. But the power can also be a great tool for helping teach the concepts to those high school kids. Right. Look, you're supposed to be around 60%. Okay, now we're doing CV. You're supposed to be around 90%. Not 98%. Mm -hmm. 90%. Mm -hmm. You know, and then he can teach the concept because Jonathan understands this. That 90% is really improving the number of mitochondria you have, the amount of enzymes in they, have, they have, the ability to process available oxygen. We're targeting the faster and immediate muscle fibers. Mm -hmm. When we start going up here to 97 98%, our major emphasis then is the heart. We're mm -hmm. trying to improve the heart's capacity to pump blood, but you don't need you don't need to do that very often. A little goes a long way. It's sort of like salt in your food. A little goes a long way. We don't need a lot of VO two max. So let's not do 97, 98 percent for these repeat thousands. Let's dial it back to the power you're supposed to have. All right, you're supposed to be running 16 watts lower than you are right now. Because that will develop the aerobic ability of fast and immediate fibers without crushing you. Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to have several weeks in a row of uninterrupted training, and you'll get stronger and stronger, and your aerobic ability will get better and better because you'll notice it in the race that you don't slow down as much. And a high school athlete might even be able to, let's just say uh, you race every one to two weeks, you might be able to help that uh, athlete understand that they might be improving over the course of the season, but maybe a course is harder and their time is 20 seconds slower, but exactly. you know, there was exactly. up by 0.15 versus two weeks mm -hmm. ago. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I totally stand by your point of illustrating to high school kids is a hard thing to get across like the subjects of, you know, how they train or how, how a coach wants to help athletes understand training and stuff. But I, I think that, yeah, that's a great point to help the athletes understand from the coach's perspective too. Well, you know, in the South where Jonathan's located, uh, not only do they have variations in on their course profile, just like other places do, there are some locations around America where the courses are mostly flat because they're just not that many hills. Sure. But you know, Jonathan's case, he might they might go one week uh, to a, a rolling golf course, right, and it's 83 degrees, mm -hmm. and then a week later they're running on a course as there's a course down there that's really challenging. They use it for the state meet. It's really big hills. And they may run your the athletes may only run uh, seventeen twelve say in, uh, instead of seventeen minutes, sure. and they think that they're not getting worse. Right. And the normal coach, you know, the one that doesn't understand these little nuances, would say, "You need to concentrate more. You need to when it gets tough." Well, Jonathan knows. No, no, that's not the case. It's a hillier course. Mm -hmm. In 
now one with stride power meters, he can prove, look, you actually average seven watts higher on this course, even though you ran 12 seconds slower, right? It was a better you if you do a little bit of the math, you right. actually ran 24 seconds faster than you did the previous week if you were right. running on the same course. Right. Totally. And if the weather's there, and that's a factor, that weather changes down there, it's 91 degrees one week and 83 another, that can be factored. And you can look at the book that I co-authored with Pete McGill and Melissa Breyer. I got it, I think it's page 56. You can see you can convert, right, what it is uh, for, by heat index at 52 and a half degrees, you know, that's optimal. Well, you're 75 one week and you're 92 another week. Well, if you look at the chart, you can see, okay, that's a 17 second differential. Right, you can start to understand. Yeah. But your power would reflect to a degree some of that yeah. as well. Yes, exactly. Um, we have a couple of people were saying in the chat after you mentioned your your study. Can you talk just a little bit about before we wrap up um, what you might be looking for in people that might want to uh, help participate in the study? Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at uh, tentatively two different groups. Mm -hmm. um, elite runners defined as basically within 7% of the Olympic trials qualifying standard. So uh, off the top of my head, that would be probably somebody who can run in the upper 29s in the 10K, right? Let's say 29.57 or something. That's approximately. And then I need recreational runners. So I need to have groups that are not crossover. I can't have a bunch of guys that are 14.55 guys when 14.25 is the cutoff. Because that'll skew the results. I want to see if there really is a difference between recreational runners and elite runners in terms of their endurance index and profile. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for people, say, in males that are in the Boulder area, 17 minutes to 21 minutes, as an example, or females, uh, say, 19 uh, to 23 minutes for 5K. And then I'm looking for males who are, say, roughly 14, 25 or under um, at sea level, that sort of thing or females that would be, you know, maybe another 30 seconds slower than that. Right. 45 seconds slower than that. Anyway, my point is um, I will post I will post it um, around Eugene. I'm not, I keep saying Eugene. <laughs> I guess I kind of like Eugene right. uh, also when I was there, but I'll post it in running stores. Um, around if I have somebody help me figure out how to do it in Instagram, because I'm not a technology guy and maybe it's my age. Maybe my guys on the team will help me. I'll post it on an Instagram or something like that, the kinds of uh, runners, times that I, I need um, and how to how to get a hold of me to be a participant in the study, that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, um, basically, if, if I end up doing what I think I'm going to have to do instead of the laboratory research, I'll probably have something like a 200-meter time trial, an 800-meter time trial, and either a 2,000 or a 3,000-meter time trial. Mm -hmm. um, the shorter time trials will probably be done in the same day, mm -hmm. such as the 200 meter time trial, and then you have a 30 minute rest, and then you do an 800, mm -hmm. and then four days later you do the longer time trial, 2,000 or 3,000. And then what I'm going to do is profiling, so I'll be able to identify your aerobic and anaerobic, your speed components, and put it into regression equation. And then you get a. a, a I'm going to go one step further in my dissertation. Is I'm going to um, provide you with a document that shows you where what your profile is and some recommendations. Very cool. What you can do for your own training. Very very cool. Um, yeah. So the last question that uh, Angus just sent is: If somebody was interested in uh, coaching from yourself, where should they contact you, and where can people learn more about oh, you? Okay. Good question. Uh, Runfastcoach.com. That's the best place to go. Runfastcoach.com. Awesome. So you'll see um, I have coaching services there and a training plan option. So those awesome. are two options. Training plan is um, I design it, I personalize a training plan for you, and then once I design it, you're on your own. Awesome. Okay, if you want the coaching service, it's an interactive, ongoing. I adjust your training as needed. Um, and life is life is variable, you know. You cancel this race, you had that race, you're sick, you're injured. You got to travel for business. In high school situations, races get canceled all the time. You wouldn't believe how often it happens. Right. So what do you do? Well, if you have a training plan, uh, you're going to have to, you know, adjust on your own. Right. But if you have me, I will adjust for you. 
Right. And you're going to learn something along the way too. I'll t talk to you. You're going to learn more about things like, uh, you know, um, recovery or strength training and so on and so forth. I don't design specific strength training workouts. I leave that to Chris Lee, my strength coach, someone like that. Yep. Um, but I have uh, all kinds of info. Uh, Pete, Pete McGill, Melissa Bryan, and I have all kinds of info in our book, uh, Build Your Running Body, 328 uh, illustration or um, pictures of runners doing uh, strengthening exercises, routines in there, that sort of thing that you can use. Um, but I can tell you when to do the strength training and when to back off, when right. to do your core training, when to back off, rules of thumb, that sort of thing. And that's runfastcoach.com. Yes, that's correct, Evan. Awesome. Um, cool. Well, Tom, I want to thank you so much. This was so informative. Uh, and I think people would love to get you back for another one in a couple of weeks. Um, even just to answer people's questions, people have, you know, so much to ask and you have so much to answer. So um, myself and the whole stride team, thanks to a ton. I uh, hope everybody out there listening is, is doing well, but uh, this wraps up this episode of the webinar. Thanks again, Tom, for coming on. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And I would suggest one thing is if if we do this again, as we have people write in questions ahead of time, yes. so we'll address what the community out there, the running community wants to hear, whether you're a coach or whether you're a runner, mm -hmm. uh, submit your questions. Absolutely. Um, and perhaps Stride can create a way of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. We will uh, we'll for sure talk about it as soon as we uh, end this webinar. But this was so exciting. Uh, I think that is everything. Producer Gus, you are uh, good, good to wrap it up. Thanks again, Tom. <laughs> You're welcome, Evan. Take care. Awesome.